welcome to GBC Online. Hi, Morning. Mark. Hey, Rox, how are you? I'm very well. What about yourself? Doing okay. Doing, Doing okay. all right. You must be pretty happy with the weather right now. It's I am. It's chilly. I am. Cold weather is the kind of the good weather as Ooh. far as I'm concerned. Ooh, yeah. So it's all very good. And you got plans for the long weekend? Well, it is the long weekend. I'm going to be in church because there's so much happening in church. Super excited. We've got baptisms this weekend in church, which we is do. cool. We do. And you're probably away, maybe. Um, so if you are away on the long weekend and you're just jumping into online, let us know where you are. Just type it up in the chat, log in. Um, we'd like to know where you are. Could be the most varied Sunday we've ever had. Oh, you that's know, right. A, a lounge room someplace else. Yeah. Who is the furthest away? We want to oh, know. <laughs> oh, a small prize, except that... Uh, we don't have any prizes. We don't. No, so. the prize is listening to you preach. <laughs> that's right. Yes, that's what that's it is. Right. What a prize. <laughs> yeah, what exactly. a prize. So John's gospel? Yep, we're continuing our series in following John, uh, sorry, following Jesus in John's gospel. I've kind of mixed those up like heaps during this series, but uh, we're going to be looking at what the, basically the last invitation to follow Jesus uh, in the gospels in chapter 21. So ooh, looking forward to that. Ooh, but it's not the, the end of the series, it's just your preaching on the last bit. Yes, yes. There's one more week next week in this series mm. before we get back into On This Rock during the school holidays. Fantastic. Well, why don't I pray for us as we commit our hearts um, and our lives to the Lord. So, mm. should we pray? Father God, we thank you uh, for our church, Lord God, um, for every person in our community, no matter where they are, Lord God, whether they're on site or online or traveling, we pray your hand will be over them and you would keep them safe and keep them connected to you and your word through the power of your Holy Spirit. And today, Lord God, we, we do pray for the word that Mark brings, that you will use it to speak to our hearts, Lord God, to teach us, to lift our eyes to heaven, Lord God, and help us to live lives that are, are transformed by you uh, so that we can reach this world that is lost without you. So we ask for your will and your way today, Lord God. Uh, for we ask it in your son's name. Amen. You are with me. What can
Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still and striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ. on flesh, fullness of God in helpless pain, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. Welcome to Kids Home. I'm back. Last week we heard the story of Lazarus and so this week we decided to go out and ask some of the kids what they remember about the story. Tell us what happened in the story. A guy who um, died but then Jesus helped him and he came alive again. Um, I learned about how um, Jesus waited two whole nights for Laz to till Lazarus came back to life by him. Um, about Lazarus had, had, had died. Yeah. And you made this. Lazarus has got really sick and he, he even died. Did Jesus come and see Lazarus straight away? He stayed where he was for two more days. How did it make you feel? Made me feel sad and like Jesus was betraying his best friend and made me worry. And that he was, like Lazarus would have been a bit confused before he died. Yeah. That he wasn't coming to see him. Weird because he should have gone straight away. Um, it made me feel a bit depressed and confused and annoyed. 
Then what did Jesus do? He cried because he couldn't bear his friend's sad. Yeah. And, and because he was showing that he was human. And because he, he loves Lazarus, Lazarus, even though he knew he was going to um, make Lazarus alive again, he, he still was sad that he was dead. Why did Jesus wait? Because I think he was waiting for Lazarus to die because it was part of um, Jesus, um, God's big plan. It's really hard to think that Jesus didn't come straight away to help Lazarus. But the most important thing to remember is what he told his disciples. Jesus knew it would not end in death, but it was for God's glory. And if Lazarus had just gotten sick and he hadn't died, that wouldn't be an amazing miracle. He knew how much glory it would bring to God with him dying. And he was still with Lazarus. He was with Mary and Martha and he still loved them. And he's still with us. Even when things are hard and difficult and sad, he still loves us and he's still with us. So we'll see you next week. Hi, church family, just a few updates for you as we continue in our services. Firstly, as you know, it has been May Mission Month and what a great month it's been with our partner programs and also our frontline missionaries. Our goal this year was to reach the sum of $198,000 and I'm very, very, very pleased to announce that we have actually exceeded our target this year and we have currently raised the sum of $244,000. So church, what a way to be others focused. Um, it just makes my heart so happy to, to see that our church is, is so others focused and committed to the work of God um, in the world and right here at home. So well done church, uh, $244,000, nearly $50,000 over our total. Um, just love that it shows how much we trust in the Lord and um, believe in what he is doing in this place. Um, and speaking of being others focused and trusting in the Lord, we have another opportunity right now to help our local community. You may have heard of Hope Drive. We've been doing Hope Drive all through last year. And Hope Drive is a time where once a month we bring non-perishable items into our church and we distribute them through the work of Hopefield. Today, we have an opportunity for drive-through um, and you can bring your non-perishable goods uh, through the church facility, not through the facility, just the driveway, sadly, um, but you can drop them off to the team and that's from 1.30 till 3. So if you've got some goods at home and you're close by and you're not away for the long weekend, why don't you bring those round from 1.30 till 3. So church, Let's spend some time together in prayer. Will you pray with me? Father God, we want to thank you so much. Um, and with our hearts are, are filled with joy, Lord God, because you have made us to be generous people, people who trust in you. And we thank you, Lord God, for the, that we could exceed the target for May Mission Month this year. Thank you, God, that you are teaching us to be others focused um, and to put others before ourselves. And Lord, we pray for the funds and the resources raised. Uh, we pray for our mission partners, Lord God, and we pray for our frontline missionaries. Lord, we ask that each of those organisations and each of those individuals will continue to just rely on you for everything they need. Uh, we pray, Lord God, that you will, uh, through the power of your spirit, work in them in all every context, Lord God, in the, the Bible translations, Lord Jesus, so that our Indigenous communities can read scripture in their heart language. And we pray for our, our partner churches um, in Lebanon who are serving the Syrian refugees, Lord Jesus, that they will continue to, to, to reach out with love and compassion and, um, and your word, Lord God, in order to minister to your people that are so hurting. And Lord, in our frontline missionaries, we pray for each of them in their context, Lord Jesus, that they will draw near to you, Father that um, you will be the one who works in them and through them to reach, uh, reach the world, Lord God, with the truth of your gospel um, and the knowledge of your love. Uh, so, Lord, we, we thank you so much for this and thank you for um, what it's doing in our church, Lord God, that um, our church community can be united in, in giving and, um, and being others-focused, Lord God, that you're actually not only um, helping our missionaries, but you're also helping us. You're helping us change our hearts um, and our lives so that we can reflect you more um, to, our, to our family, to our friends and in our local community. 
Um, we pray also to Lord God for the work of Hopefield um, and we thank you for the items that are going to come in through Hope Drive. And Lord, I pray that each person who receives um, that level of help from Hopefield, that they would feel the love of Jesus, Lord God, that they will know that they are not alone, that there are people who care for them and those people are a reflection of you, Lord God. Uh, so, Lord, we can't necessarily give items to, to those individuals who are receiving them, Lord God, but through the power of your spirit, you can touch their hearts and lives. And, and we ask that you do that in that miraculous way that you do. Um, so, Lord, we, we thank you for this church and we pray that you would use this to be a beacon of light. Uh, use our community to be um, a people who are interested in those around us, a people of compassion, a people of love, um, and that, yeah, that you would use this church to reach a generation. Uh, we also want to pray for those who are getting baptised this weekend, Lord God, and thank you for their obedience in that. Uh, and we pray, Jesus, that the families who, um, who are coming along to, to see the baptisms and those, um, those young people who are getting baptised, that they too would be able to go out and be people who follow you, that they will be disciples who make other disciples, uh, and so that our community will be transformed by people coming to know you, Lord Jesus. Uh, so all these things, Lord God, and the unspoken prayers in our hearts, we lift them before you, knowing that you hear them, you listen, and that you, you love us and you act. And for that, we say thank you. And we ask that in your son's name. Amen. Hi, church. We're going to have our Bible reading now. And this Bible reading comes from the book of John, chapter 21, verse 15, all the way through to verse 19. And in my Bible, the heading is Jesus reinstates Peter. When they had finished eating... Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, Son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. And Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Well, thanks, Rox, for reading that passage for us. Uh, as Rox said, this passage uh, is, is titled The Reinstatement of Peter. And I think the reasons are fairly obvious. Uh, you don't have to be a very careful reader of uh, Scripture to recognize that the threefold question that Jesus asks Peter, do you love me, do you love me, do you love me, echoes and parallels the three denials of Peter just a couple of chapters prior. Uh, we recognize that what Jesus is doing in this situation is indeed reinstating Peter. Uh, and it's a bit of a curious reinstatement, or at least I found it so. Uh, Peter doesn't confess to Jesus his failure, uh, doesn't confess to him that you were right, I would deny you three times. He doesn't uh, say that he's sorry uh, because of what he had done, nor does Jesus, um, shall we say, affirm that he is forgiven or state that he's forgiven. I think both Peter knew that Jesus knew what he had done and that Jesus knew that Peter knew that he was forgiven. Uh, but this passage with this threefold question of do you love me? followed by Peter's affirmation three times of, yes, Lord, I do love you, is then followed by the three commands of Jesus to feed his sheep, to tend his lambs, to feed his sheep. This language of involvement in mission, all of which brings us to one of the last references to follow me in the gospel. And you'll know, of course, that over the course of this series, we have been looking at John's unique take on what it means to follow Jesus, paying very careful attention when we can to the context in which Jesus says, follow me, or speaks about what it means to follow. And so while this passage is very much about Peter, 
about uh, his reinstatement, about his denial, about uh, his death in that kind of that um, ambiguous statement about being led where he does not want to go, uh, and the, the call for Peter to follow Jesus, there is still, of course, a representative component of this. John is writing the gospel not just to tell us about Peter. This chapter is not kind of tying up some narrative loose ends just so we make sure that we know what happened. This is still a message for you and for me. This is a message for anyone who begins to follow after Jesus. And so the things that Jesus asks of Peter, the things that Jesus then gives Peter to do, the statement to follow him are statements to us as well. And therefore, it's helpful for us to draw back just a little bit and uh, try to pay some attention to the context in which this interaction takes place and what it might mean for you and for I. Now, of course, this passage takes place in chapter 21. It's the unexpected epilogue to the book. And I say unexpected because of the way chapter 20 unfolds. In John chapter 20, Jesus rises from the dead. Uh, He appears to Mary Magdalene in the garden. Then he appears to his disciples in the locked upper room where he gives to them the great commission or John's version of it. As the father sent me, I am sending you. He breathes on them, says, receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, Then kind of gives them the parameters of their mission to be about the work of forgiveness, extending forgiveness and reconciliation and renewal, the kind of the continuation of Jesus' own ministry. Then he appears again to the disciples, this time when Thomas is present. Uh, And as Thomas declares that Jesus is indeed his Lord and God, Jesus makes a statement that is totally appropriate for people who are reading the gospel, which is, blessed are those who believe but have not seen. And then John kind of wraps the gospel up by saying that Jesus performed lots of other signs, but that these signs have been written down so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And so uh, it, it kind of wraps the gospel up quite nicely. And so we're a little bit caught off guard by the fact that there is an afterward in chapter 21. But there is. And we're told in chapter 21 at the beginning that Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. We're told at the end of verse 14 that this was the third time. And so there's, again, a a kind of a continuation. There's the first appearance to the disciples in the upper room when, when Thomas was not present. The second appearance when Thomas was, and now this third appearance. And we don't know exactly when it took place. Uh, It was obviously between the day of the resurrection and Pentecost when the disciples are back in Jerusalem. But sometime, sometime between that, they find themselves again in Galilee around the Sea of Galilee. And Peter is with six other disciples, Thomas, Nathaniel, uh, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples. There's seven of them there. And Peter says, I'm going to go fishing. And uh, the other disciples say, we're going to go with you. Now, I don't know much about fishing. Uh, I don't really like fishing. I think if I could be guaranteed that I could catch a really cool fish every time I went out and that could be done in about 15 minutes, I think I'd be into it. Uh, But it doesn't seem to work that way. But these men who we know from the Synoptic Gospels were fishermen, go out and they spend all night and they catch nothing. Now, they're not fishing by line, they're fishing by net. They're kind of trawling in in, in that sense. And I think it's a little bit surprising that they catch absolutely nothing. And again, I'm not much of a fisherman, but I can imagine that this would be really frustrating for them, working all night at what they know how to do, and yet being incapable, it seems, of finding any fish. So after a night of frustration and disappointment with an empty boat and empty nets and empty stomachs, the sun rises and there's a man on the shore. Now, John tells us that this is Jesus, but the disciples didn't recognize him. And he calls out to them. And in the Greek, it's not just friends, it's children. Children, haven't you any fish? They answer no. And this stranger on the shore says, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. Now, we're not told the, the, the details of this, but I would like to think that the right side of the boat was on the shore side. Uh, I have no idea if that's the case or not, but I'd like to think that it is. So that as the men threw the net into the water and it 
filled with fish that they could have seen Jesus on the shore, grinning, smiling, giving them a thumbs up, something. Um, Because in the midst of this enormous catch, because that's what happens, uh, John tells us at the end of the passage that there were 153 large fish. Just imagine this. After finding no fish all night, they drop the net in on the other side, and it is immediately uh, filled with fish, thrashing away, and seven men cannot haul it into the boat. Just imagine that. 150 fish thrashing around in some net, the boat kind of tipping towards them, water sloshing into the bottom, the seven of them yelling at one another, trying to organize how they're going to get these fish into the boat itself. And miraculously, the net remains untorn. It's like catching a shark on a kind of a little kid's fishing rod. It's like amazing that this would happen. And in the midst of all of this, John clues into what's happened. And he, I can imagine, yells at Peter. I can't imagine it was a quiet whisper in the ear given all the chaos in the boat. He says, it's the Lord. And Peter recognizes who Jesus is, drops his part of the net. I'm not sure how the disciples felt about that. Throws on his cloak and jumps into the water and swims to shore. Well, the disciples follow shortly after towing the net behind them. And when they arrive there, they actually find that Jesus is ready for them. If you have a look in verse 9, it says, When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. So while Jesus had asked them if they had any fish, he didn't actually need any. And all of a sudden, this starts to sound a little bit familiar, doesn't it? A group of hungry men who are met by Jesus' provision of bread and fish. Jesus says, bring some of the fish you've just caught. And so Simon wanders over. They drag the net onto the shore. We're told how many fish they were. And then Jesus says, come and have breakfast. And we're told that Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. So we have these images in our head, don't we, of the feeding of the 5,000, the provision of Jesus again. Where did he get the fish? Where did he get the bread? It's not answered. We don't need to know. But he has provided for his disciples. He has hosted them at a meal. He has filled their emptiness with abundance. And this is the context in which Jesus has this conversation with Peter. This conversation where, as we've already said, he seeks to reinstate him. To acknowledge that while Peter had denied Jesus three times after swearing that he would give his life for Jesus. Now Jesus asks him three times, do you love me? and speaks about the fact that he will indeed give his life for him. And he uses the imagery, of course, of of the flock. He says, feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, feed my sheep. Uh, And as we've talked about in this series, the uh, shepherding imagery is a fairly prevalent one in Scripture, whether it be a passage like Psalm 23, a very familiar psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Or whether it's a slightly more obscure passage like in Ezekiel 34, where the prophet um, condemns the leaders of Israel for their failure to shepherd the flock and declares God's intention to feed his flock, to be their shepherd. And there are many other passages in scripture that refer to God as the shepherd of his people speak of the leadership of those who uh, oversaw the people of Israel and often their failure. In the gospel itself, Jesus has described himself as the good shepherd, as the one who, when he calls his sheep, hear his voice and follow after him. He describes himself as the gate, as the one who will not run away when there's danger, who will, in fact, lay his life down for the sheep. This is the the language of shepherding that we have leading up to this. But it's interesting that twice Jesus says to Peter, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. I don't think we need to make too much of the difference between the the lambs and the sheep. I think it's just all kind of part of the same conversation. But it's interesting that Jesus would say twice, feed my sheep, feed the flock, be about the work that I myself am about. Because the most um, immediate context for feeding is the start of chapter 21. 
For Peter to understand what it meant for him to feed the sheep, feed the lambs, to tend the flock, Jesus has just presented to him, to the disciples, exactly what he means by that. I think it's really intriguing to note that uh, when Jesus gives this command to mission, when he gives Peter his um, directives, if you love me, then feed my sheep. When you, if you love me, then take care of my lambs, like care for the flock. This is a continuation of Jesus's ministry, very much like what we read in chapter 20. And you're familiar if you've been around the church for a while here with these words, as the father sent me, I am sending you. This sense of what we are called to, what Peter was called to, uh, was to continue the work of Jesus to continue the work of Jesus, to care for those who were beginning to follow him, uh, to to, to feed those, to meet the needs of those who were following after Jesus. But I think it's so significant to recognize that not only is the ministry of Peter and the ministry that we are invited into as well, is not just a continuation of Jesus's ministry, but it is also done in the resources that Jesus provides. In chapter 21, those first 14 verses, the disciples are unable to even feed themselves. In their own strength, in their own resources, with all of their skillfulness, with all of their experience, they fished all night and caught nothing until Jesus arrives. And then there is abundance and fullness and excess And what we learn is that even when that excess has been brought into the boat, when it's been brought onto the shore, it's not necessary that Jesus has already provided all that is needed, that Jesus is the host. And just as in the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus broke the bread and broke the fish and gave it to the disciples who gave it to the crowd, here the same principle is at work. Jesus has fed them and then says, feed others. I provided for you, now provide for others. This is the mission that Jesus gives to Peter and by extension to us. When Jesus says to Peter and by extension to us, follow me, this is what he means. I think it's worth noting two other things. First of all, this is the the first time that the risen Jesus has invited people to follow him. Every other um, example of following has been prior to Jesus' death and resurrection. This uh, change in who Jesus is, now uh, fully glorified, vindicated by the Father, the completion of his atoning work, now he says, follow me. And I find it striking that earlier, um, earlier invitations to follow Jesus were to get to know him, to spend time with him, to get to know the Father. And yet here... When the risen Lord says, follow me, there is a mission that is given. I also think it's really interesting to note the context of chapter 21, verses 1 to 14. I don't know if you picked it. In chapter 20, Jesus has given to the disciples the grand commission. As the Father sent me, I am sending you. Uh, In in the very same way, to do the same sorts of things that the Father has sent me to do, I now send you. He has breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. He's given them the resources they need. He's called them to this incredible ministry of continuing what Jesus himself has done. And chapter 21 opens with the disciples on the Sea of Galilee with nothing better to do than go fishing. That was not The mission. The mission was not to kind of have a break between now and Pentecost. We'll see you in 50 days and then we'll kind of kick off. There was no sense that Jesus says to the disciples on the evening of his resurrection, oh, you can start whenever you like. I mean, what in the world were they doing fishing? I mean, led by Simon Peter, it seems. He's the first one mentioned. There's seven of them. We don't know what happened to the other four. There's seven of them gathered there. When Peter says, oh, let's go fishing, they'll go, yeah, all right. What are they doing fishing? That is not the mission. And I find it interesting that when they are not about the mission of Jesus, there is frustration, futility, emptiness, 
and hunger. Now, let me be clear. I don't believe that um, every time we experience frustration or disappointment or we have a long night where we catch nothing, I would not want to suggest for a moment that every time that there is a, a lack for us, that we are somehow off mission. But I do find it interesting that for the disciples, the place of abundance, the place of provision, the place of resourcing, the place of fullness is on mission. I think it raises the questions that Jesus asks and the commands that Jesus gives. Because Jesus asks to each one of us who have, in different contexts, done exactly what Peter has done. Said, we, we will follow you. And then crumbled. And there's the first kind of pressure. And Jesus asks each one of us, do you love me? Do you love me more than these? And if we can find it in ourselves to affirm that, to profess our love for Jesus as imperfect as, as, and as frail as it may be, then Jesus gives to each one of us a mission to continue what he has done in the resources that he has given us. This is what it means for us to follow the risen Jesus. Do you love Jesus? Then there is a mission that he has given to you. Regardless of how old you are or how young you are, how healthy you may be, how well connected you might find yourself, what skills and experiences you may have, there is a mission for you as a follower of Jesus to participate in the grand plan of God to renew and restore all things. Are you doing it? And if you find yourself like the disciples, kind of off mission and in some boat somewhere, metaphorically fishing, I think it is finally worth noting that Jesus does not once condemn them here. In fact, he arrives in Galilee, feeds them, hosts them, gently reminds them of what they are called to do and invites them to follow him. And that invitation, that gentle reminder, that powerful resource, that deep forgiveness exists for you and I. Do you love me more than these? And feed my lambs. Follow me. These are the words of Jesus to you and to me. Wow, what a powerful word that was this morning. Thanks, Mark, for that. So, church, I feel there was such a challenge in that this morning. Just listening to that, uh, it's a challenge to think about, you know, the mission that God has sent you on. And my prayer for you this week would be that you do ask the Lord, what is it that you have for me to do, Lord God? Here I am. And if you're in the boat and, um, and you're frustrated and the boat's empty, the resources that Jesus provides are all you need to partner with him and do the work that he is sending you out to do. So pray this week that God will show you the mission, that he will resource you with everything you need because he promises that and he will fulfill it. So church, have a great week. We will see you next time. You are with me. What can separate us? You are for me. What can stand against us? You love it all.
Thank you. 